All right, good afternoon and welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm David Gray and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our discussion today, Child Care and Race to the Top. Will the new federal competition foster innovation and bring more attention to the needs of parents and children? We at New America have begun a new emphasis on policies that promote quality child care is an important issue that needs renewed emphasis in America at the state and particularly federal level we feel and that can make a real difference in the educational outcomes of children and in the employment outcomes of their parents. We believe it is important to the strength of our economy and families and critical for the social mobility of our nation. And so today we place a particular focus on child care and early learning, on federal incentives in the race to the top competition and on the impacts of this competition and related policy interventions on families, states, and the child care system. And I can see from the strong turnout today on this most warm day that you agree on the importance of the issue. As you all know, in May, President Obama announced a $500 million federal grant competition to improve early childhood education in America. This competition, modeled on the race to the top program that spotlighted the need for public school reform, has potential to increase focus on the importance of children's earliest years of life for healthy cognitive and social development. This comes, as you know, at a time when Congress and many states are thinking about ways to improve child care as well. And so the questions arise. What innovations in child care will result? Which states are already making changes to their systems that give them a leg up in the competition? What resources will be needed to scale up these innova innovations? To help us think through these and other important issues, today we are glad and very pleased to welcome Kathy Glazer, Director of the State Services at BUILD, Gina Adams, Senior Fellow in the Center for Labor, Human Services, and Population at the Urban Institute. Their full biographies are available outside, but Kathy and Gina, thank you very much for being with us today. And to guide us this afternoon is our moderator and an expert in these policy issues herself, Lisa Guernsey, the director of our Early Education Initiative here at New America. Then we'll open it up to your questions. And so thank you all for being here today. Thanks to all who are watching as we broadcast this over the internet, and thank you to the Annie E. Casey Foundation for making this event possible. And now let me turn things over to Lisa Guernsey. Lisa? Thank you. Thanks, David. It's really great to see everybody, especially given how hot it is. I think we also have a lot of folks watching um, the streaming video on, online. So hello to everyone out there as well who maybe didn't want to brave the heat. Um, so folks, we have a new acronym here in Washington, D.C., R-T-T-E-L-C. Uh, but I think that for the most part, we'll be talking about it today as the Early Learning Challenge which, as I think most of us here know, is the birth to five version of Race to the Top, which you know, more than two years ago had attracted quite a bit of attention for its ability to push states into adopting new strategies in the K-12 realm. So will this new competition do the same? And will it cause states to sit up and take notice? Is it going to be asking states to do very specific things, and what are those things that it will be asking states to do? Which states are going to come away as winners once they win? What are they really going to be able to do with the money? Which could be up to $100 million for states with the largest high-need populations, at least from what we've seen in the draft guidelines of this competition so far. So, so today we're, not, we're going to try, I'm going to try, not to get too far ahead of, of our, myself and ourselves here. Um, because we're not going to be able to answer um, many of those questions, particularly the latter ones. But what we can do is really think about the first part of what I was asking, which is what is this competition asking states to do? Uh, what is the vision that the Obama administration has laid out? And at, at this point, as I said, we have draft guidelines. Um, a little over a week ago or so, we saw um, a, a document that proposed requirements for this competition. And we're now at the stage where we're awaiting the final. The, com the comment period has already ended. And we are going to, hopefully by the end of um, August, have a sense of exactly what states will be required to do if they want to go for this, um, this, this extra money. So I want to take a moment to just um, talk about childcare within the Race to the Top program and the Early Learning Challenge. Um, because here at, at New America, for those who have followed what the Early Education Initiative has 
presented in the past and written about, we, we focus very much on, on early learning and early education. And, um, and when we say childcare, we're really talking about um, a, a broader way of looking at, at education so, so, so that we're not just talking about pre-kindergarten programs and not just talking about Head Start, but really talking about the, the, the bulk of the programs that children before school are in every day and are enrolled in every day. Um, and we know that there are a million or so, uh, three and a four year olds in state funded pre-K programs. And there are nearly another million in Head Start if you count the kids uh, from infancy all the way up through age five. But still, there are still far more children who are enrolled in what is lumped into this big, tangled, amorphous thing called child care. And while well, there needs to be absolutely, we've been accelerating efforts as much as possible to, to elevate child care and think about it as an early learning environment for children, there are many child care programs that have a long way to go before they get to that space. And, and might be you know, considered structured enough, providing enough kind of intentional teaching um, and learning opportunities for young kids to be um, early learning programs. So in this federal competition, there is an unprecedented uh, emphasis on making sure that, that child care programs are also kind of seen as a place where that kind of quality can be instilled. And it's also unprecedented, I think we should note at the beginning here, that this is something that's a joint vision from the Department of Education and Health and Human Services. Um, and so that already puts a really interesting um, gloss on the whole thing and is a, a really new way of thinking about what these issues are and how they should be intersecting. Uh, so we're really fortunate today to have both Gina and Kathy here to kind of talk through a lot of these pieces and figure out and try to maybe um, surface some of the, the tensions and the larger issues that are involved in creating a vision for, for how to build out a much more high quality child care systems. Um, and I want to start then um, with you, Kathy, and direct several of our questions to you because I know that you are seeing through your work at BUILD um, much more on the ground what states are doing to innovate and to try to bring higher quality to to child care programs as well as pre-K programs as well as other learning programs and of course again those definitions keep kind of overlapping in and of themselves. I think we can talk about that here today. Um, but I was wondering if you can maybe provide us with some context to get started. So as I was just saying, you know, we there's this variability in child care and there are a lot of questions around um, how to make sure to build them out so that they can be early learning settings for young children as much as they can also be very much helpful and supportive to parents who are working. So of those settings out there right now that are called child care settings, do we have any idea of how many could be labeled high quality? Well, it's an interesting question and a complicated one right off the bat because we don't really have any common definition of what we mean by quality. And uh, I think most of the reports or the research that has been done on that would point to, you know, a high percentage of the care that's available as being, at best, mediocre. So it's a really important focus to try to uh, figure out strategies to support all types of early learning programs to be of higher quality and uh, the type of care that is not only effective in supporting parents while they work, but also and uh, probably more importantly, the school readiness skills and needs of children uh, in those settings. You uh, touched on the fact that there is this very diverse array and it's quite fragmented and uh, not only in the types and locations of settings, but also in the funding streams, the funding blocks that, uh, that pay for a lot of it, uh, the, you know, the public-private mix of dollars that go into it, the uh, general purposes or objectives of the care based on the funding stream. Some is really specifically to be a support for parents, others more focused on the child needs. There are wildly different standards um, of quality or of uh, expectations for what's provided during that time frame. Some funding blocks, too, also specify the age of the child or the income level of parents. So it's you know, a, a wide variety, very fragmented, and really hard to get our hands around. And I think the strategy of, of QRIS is meant to be kind of a framework that brings some coherence to this particular population. So QRIS 
So mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people in the audience probably know what that is, but do you mind just, number one, we're talking about quality rating improvement systems. Sure. And do you just give us your definition and what you at Build sure. are, are doing. Sure. And probably many people in this audience could write a dissertation or have <laughs> on QRIS, but basically it's a strategy that helps to assess um, and support the improvement of and communicate the quality features of, of early learning settings across the, the variety, across the spectrum. And again, in addition to doing that and being a support for programs and for the providers in those programs to um, really do the best they can with the time that they have with the child, it's also a great framework that we can work on in terms of trying to increase access and funding for high quality care. And just to kind of not put too fine of a point on it, essentially they're, you know, the star rating systems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where programs are um, given either one star, two star, three stars, in some states it's up to five, for meeting certain criteria. And um, one of the things that's very evident in the guidelines that were Mm -hmm. put out by the Obama administration uh, two weeks ago was how important they appear to see these QRAS systems mm -hmm. as a structure for building out better quality. Um, and yet we know that there are many states that do not yet have these systems in place. I think there's certainly still a lot of debate within the early childhood mm -hmm. community about whether these you know, will in fact push quality in the right direction and mm -hmm. whether there are the supports to, to make that happen. So. And I know certainly that BUILD um, has been helping states create those starred um, programs. What right now are you seeing as, um, as some of the fundamental um, problems that the states are grappling with and the solutions that they're, mm -hmm. that they're coming towards when it comes to those? Sure. Well, I would say, you know, you mentioned that not every state has the system. I think most every state has a system that they've built to try to um, provide a basis for quality improvement through the CCDF funding block. And I think that probably the majority of states have aligned that with the development of a QRIS. Uh, I think the last figure I saw that was um, describing the number of states that have what would be you know, considered a fully fleshed out QRIS was about 23. But I would say that the majority of states are in some, um, at some point along the continuum of planning for piloting or fully implementing a QRIS. So it is, you know, more and more the trend is that that is the centerpiece of the state's discussion on quality care for children. Okay, okay. And in fact, I saw something yesterday, um, I thought the, the number 37 is coming to mind. It was in a report that came out from the, um, the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment um, that was saying that we, they tracked at least 37 states that are either um, in strong development or have been for many years using the, the QRAS systems. Um, so is there, is there something about the QRAS system that helps to elevate quality and I guess we do need to obviously put some definitions around quality this is something that the field struggles with a lot but um, when it comes to providing an opportunity for young kids to have an interaction with an adult that is helping them build their language development giving scaffolding you know in the terminology of, of, of teacher talk scaffolding their learning and helping them mm -hmm. um, kind of get to a new level in their cognitive and social development um, all of these things obviously very much center on you would think on the on, on obviously on the workforce I mean it's in, in fact you need to make sure that there's good ratios of child to staff you need to make sure that the facilities are sound and secure mm -hmm. but the the child care professionals are key to this. The teachers in the classrooms are key to this and how they interact with, with young children. And so what, what do you see in QRIS systems that helps to make sure that child care centers and, and pre-K programs and others are driving towards better mm -hmm. teaching? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's important to remember that QRIS is a strategy that rises up out of the states and every state has the chance to design their own. 
uh, which is another complicating factor. But most states choose sets of standards that include the education, training level, competencies of the workforce as a, a primary um, measure to assess and to support. And so I think that QIS actually, you know, gives a really good basis for um, figuring out how to provide the types of supports that hone in on that very important feature of, uh, of the professional's interaction with the child. I think that we're getting farther down that path, but this is still an inexact science, and I think states have a long way to go to really distill down their QRIS uh, strategies and practices to not just assess where programs are, but to get the biggest bang for the buck on what the real lever is for help supporting the workforce, the early childhood workforce, in making that magic happen with children. So let's, so let's dig into workforce here for a moment, because in addition to the focus on QRIS that the administration is putting in this competition, mm -hmm. there are many priorities around building the workforce and improving um, opportunities for um, advancement or I, I mean in terms of um, credentials as well as professional development um, among the people who are working in these early learning settings. Mm -hmm. um, what right now, if you were to, to describe to somebody the administration's take on the workforce and how to improve it, what would you say mm -hmm. the administration seems to be aiming at? And then secondly, do you agree or disagree with their, mm -hmm. their strategy? Well, I think you know, from the, uh, the draft that we've seen of what we think the application may be, the administration is certainly supportive of the uh, strategy of QRIS. And within that, of course, the, the focus on practitioner qualifications. There's also a, a pretty good bucket in the application on workforce development, professional development systems as a really important um, component of early learning systems in states that are, um, that are a primary focus, especially for a challenge. So I think they're really driving states to try to um, be creative and innovative in the way that they approach that. We still have, I think, a long way to go, not only in figuring out how all of this relates to um, compensation of the workforce, mm -hmm and salary parity and benefits and those you know, really critical features of um, the needs of this particular workforce, but also in putting a sharper point on exactly what types of supports or qualifications result in the competencies that we want in early childhood professionals. Um, just to mention just something that's on my mind because I had I read it recently and I just mentioned it earlier, that report that came out from the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment, it was focusing on um, the fact that many of these QRIS systems may not yet be structured well enough to ensure that, um, number one, that there are ways to fully compensate or better compensate mm -hmm. the professionals that are in these classrooms. Um, and, and I'll take a step back here for those who may not know QRIS as well. Um, from what I understand, in many states, you know, if your early learning center, your child care center can show high quality, you get that second, that third star, that fourth star, but you also then, in many places, will get some additional funding mm -hmm. of, of some kind that is to be used for, uh, could be everything from professional development, um, the big question is, you know, could it be used for, for salary mm -hmm. parity? Mm -hmm. um, is it used for just, uh, just some massively wide and broad um, bucket of different benefits, um, et cetera? And, and I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if there is enough of a focus in, um, in the race to the top competition yet to ensure that the, the professionals who are part of this idea of really building out quality um, are, are, you know, both mm -hmm. supported professionally enough mm -hmm. to really make that, that quality mm -hmm. happen. 
Uh, I think there's still a ways to go there. I don't think it, that's as sharp of a point as some of the others in that. And I think that probably the, the benefit of this opportunity for states to have access to a pot of funds is to be able to be creative and innovative in really looking at and reframing their early learning system. And hopefully as a part of that, being willing to address some of these financing strategies and compensation issues. For example, you know, I think I've, I've heard, and I won't mention their names since it is a competitive process, but there are some states who are really looking forward to being able to use this funding specifically for those types of things. And for example, to shift in the direction of um, reimbursement of rates to child care programs based on their quality level, not on you know, the percentage of the market rate that, they're, um, that they fall in with. And I think that's the kind of shift toward really meeting children's needs and focusing on quality, access to high quality, that is uh, really the uh, paramount to what the early learning challenge is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other, and I'm going to get to Gina in a minute here because I, I know there's just a lot of really um, interesting kind of points swimming around here, but one of the other um, parts of the QRES, um, but I'm sorry, of the guidelines that were put out two weeks ago um, that has to do with QRIS is ensuring that many different types of providers are included in these systems, in these starred rating programs. Um, and that, first of all, you know, strikes me as an important part of ensuring that there's a real system being built out in states that is making sure that all these different um, types of providers and, mm -hmm. um, and funding streams of have some sort of coherence perhaps to them and people are seeing them under kind of mm -hmm. one umbrella. Um, but at the same time, I would imagine it, it might be either controversial or quite difficult for states to be including um, a full range of different kinds of child care uh, settings and learning settings in a, in a program like this when, um, when you have everything ranging from family-based um, kind of home or home home based kind of child care programs with um, a person who's got maybe five or six different children that they're watching of multiple different age groups mm -hmm. during the day um, all the way up through a full day kind of pre-k kindergarten program that um, has teachers with bachelor's degrees and mm -hmm. you know highly structured curriculum in, in some cases so do you see that as a as a um, Yes, I'm just curious about your views on the idea of including all of these different kinds of programs under one mm -hmm. QRIS, and if you think states will be able to, mm -hmm. to meet that mark. Well, it is a big challenge, and I think um, some states will be able to meet it on the mark that, you know, the cutoff date that was suggested in the draft application. That, that date worries me a little bit. What, what is the? Um, I think that the, the inclusion part of all programs is um, August of 2014. There's a specific date, I can't remember if it's 2013 or 14, but kind of a, a breathtaking date to try to meet that type of a requirement. And, you know, of course our concern is that there'd be such a, uh, a rush for scale up that, sac that we might sacrifice quality and really a thoughtful rate of development. But again, I think that, you know, the, the beauty of QRIS is that, and, and I'm really excited about the idea of the inclusion of all programs. I think that parents and children win when we do that, when we include all types of programs along a continuum within this framework and within our support system. And I think that it is just another way of helping um, parents understand those levels of quality as they consider that among the other, you know, factors that they need to consider in making these choices. And I also appreciate that the focus of, tar you know, the targeted funding is really for high need children. And I think that that's really critical because what we don't want is to see the quality rating and improvement system strategy, um, you know, <coughs> widen the gap further of those who have and those who have not access to high quality. So I like it that they're driving states to think about strategies that meet the needs. And I also appreciate the definition of high need that is beyond just low income. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So um, that's actually a, a nice segue to bring in um, Gina Adams and, and your work that is looking at, um, I mean, a, a wide swath of what, um, how childcare is is structured and problems with the way it's structured and um, and how it can be better um, 
structure to help parents. Um, you do a lot of uh, your recent writing that I was looking at from the fall and in presentations looks at the instability of <coughs> childcare systems, and I want to get to that a bit here. But but maybe I would like to start by asking um, how something like the race to the top competition, which has such a big focus on quality, um, might be also coupled with or could in fact support the idea of helping parents. And, and families stabilize their own incomes and be able to stay with a job, make sure that their kids are secure while they're at work. Essentially how to combine both early learning and, and focus on what children need with the focus on what the parents need. Well, let me just start. It's actually very interesting sitting here is that I'm actually not an expert on the new initiative. And it's very interesting because even those of us who are trying to meld these child development and work support worlds are siloed ourselves. I'm much more focused on this child care subsidy system through CCDF. So it's been a great learning experience and also kind of humbling to realize that despite our best efforts, we are <coughs> in our, a little bit in our own boxes. Um, let me just focus a little bit on the CCDF piece because that's, of course, the federal um, lever that we have to be theoretically affecting things, and it is the major funding that are, is in states in terms of kind of a concentrated effort that focuses on children <coughs> in the child care system. And I think one of the core elements that we have to retain as we focus on this is that it is a two-generation program. It is a program that simultaneously is affecting, whether or not people think it is, it is affecting both parents and children at this moment. About 1.6 million kids about a million families with the parents that are working. So it is a two-generation program that is affecting children. So it has to be part of this conversation. It is the main place we have resources, are designing resources to try to affect some of these problems about the market that you were talking about. Whether or not we're doing it right <laughs> is a whole other question, but I think that we have to be thinking very creatively about what that system does and doesn't do, how we can help it be a platform for supporting these kinds of efforts, connecting with these kinds of efforts, and making sure that, um, that they're working together to make sure that particularly the needs of working families, which as we know, unfortunately all too often in the quality debate are not front and center. We're talking about the kids, so somehow it's hard for all of us to keep both of these in our perspectives at the same time. So I think we have to be kind of making sure that that conversation is part of the picture and that we think very creatively about the fact that, you know, there are these systems that focus on different things. We have to get them to either be working very to get closely together to integrate those perspectives, and we have to make sure that each one can be integrating within themselves the need to connect to the other one, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, and to talk to a little bit about what constraints are there, are in place right now. I mean, are not in place, not that someone put them there on purpose, obviously, but that uh, legacy of, of many years have become part of this kind of tangle. Um, the fact that eligibility might be different between different early learning settings in terms of what parents can get, uh, whether they can enroll their children in Head Start or whether they are able to get childcare subsidies and vouchers um, being one, perhaps, but what other constraints well, I think just focusing right within the CCDF box for the moment, because I think um, there's, in each of our systems, there's problems in terms of focusing more broadly, and then there's the interconnections between them. If you think about the CCDF, I mean, historically, it has been a program that, cons that people have had in their minds as a work support. It has the quality mm -hmm. set aside, mm -hmm. which is where we have our own little silo. That's where the quality stuff happens, which, interestingly, is not always even integrated in that little piece with the subsidy side. So in terms of helping families pay for care, the vouchers that we give families and subsidies, um, the CCDF has come out of what I'd say is an old-fashioned me welfare mentality. It's been highly tightly calibrated. You have a hiccup. You lose your benefits. It's hard to get. You're quick to get cut off. We're focusing on error rates. It's a very it's not thought of as a work support. It's not thought of as something that helps families stabilize families, stabilize the market. For those of you that are familiar with the old food stamps, it's like food stamps used to be before everybody figured out that that's not a way that you actually need to be supporting families. So there's been a lot of progress, and I think people are really thinking very carefully about that. But I would argue that the very first thing, constraint that we have is, is almost a self-imposed one, which is we have to rethink how we are envisioning this program, which I think the Office of Child Care has provided great leadership on this, and states around the country are saying, 
We need to think of this as a work support. We need to think of this as a child development service. We need to think of it as a stable system that helps families access that varied market we're talking about in a stable way so the family can count on it, the provider can count on it, they know what's there. If they lose their job today, they don't lose their benefit tomorrow, which means they can't get the, go find the job. The provider doesn't know. I mean, it's, it's, the tight calibration has been a mess for everybody and has created a very unstable system. That instability has been one of the main challenges in linking with other systems because other systems don't think about you have a hiccup in the parent's life, that's going to kick the child out of the program. You think about providing a child service. Now, we're not going to be able to turn the CCDF into a three-year, you get a three-year benefit no matter whether you're working or not. But we can certainly do a lot to stabilize that benefit. Think about it as a longer term, um, I keep on going like this, it's like a, it has to undergird families in terms of helping them through instability. Um, so I think that there's, that kind of work not only stabilizes the parent's employment, in terms of allowing them, if they lose a job or if they have a change in their hours, to not have to immediately run and do something. It stabilizes the care arrangements mm -hmm. um, for the child. Good for adults, good for kids. Whoa, we've got child, and, and it's good for providers because the providers can't count on all those. Part of the challenge is for providers who are interacting with this system, they may have one child, they may have 50 kids that come from the voucher system. If you're highly reliant on the voucher system, mm -hmm. you are highly likely to be a provider that's in a very low-income community. It means the market is not there to provide you resources to provide good quality care. And then you have the system in this extreme case, I'm not saying all the states are doing this, there are many that are better, that you know, may not tell you when the child's authorized, they may not tell you when the child's terminated. So even if you have a rate, they may not be getting the rate. So you have an unstable, inadequate reimbursement even within the context of the CCDF, which is supposed to be based on the market. So I think taking steps to address that, which a number of states are doing, is really, I think, cleaning up our own house and creating a platform that stabilizes that, that then we can start building quality. There's a lot of In terms of policy, policy solutions, stuff. maybe if you could give just one or two examples, whether it's a state you've seen or, or something even within ideas that have been floated around CCDF that would um, ameliorate some of the, what you're talking about here. Yeah, I actually, um, floating around is our long list of publications, so we have 12, <laughs> I will not ask you to read all of this, go to the policy recommendation section on both for parents and providers. But I'll give a very good example, because we actually, very unusually in childcare, have a random experiment, which we never have in childcare, that they just did in Illinois, where they did two things. They lengthened the redetermined, they lengthened, kept families on longer as their eligibility went up, and they lengthened the redetermination period for a smaller person. So what instead is the of having, yeah, I was just about to say. So instead of having to, childcare is a time-limited benefit. So you walk in the door, and they'll say, you can get childcare for three months or for six months. And after six months, you have to come back and prove to us that you are still eligible. If you don't come back, you lose it. It's over. So it is. It will end unless you jump through some hoop to prove that you are still doing whatever it does. Historically, states sometimes had very, very short. I mean, the most amazing things for families on TANF, maybe two weeks. Can you imagine a provider that's going to accept you child for two weeks? <laughs> it's just, you know, you're not going to. So, so it can be very short, it can be long. One of the big things that has come out of a lot of the work that we've done and, and states have been doing is think about lengthening that and identifying other ways of figuring out if the family's lost their job so that you're not requiring the family to jump through that hoop. So six months if you had a three, 12 months if you had a six. Doing it carefully so that you're not, you know, going to be taking the family who's been committing fraud for the last six years and, you know, giving it to them. But there are a lot of families who are stably employed. Um, so in re Illinois, what they did is they, they lengthened the redetermination period and they extended eligibility. Fascinating. They found effects, depending on which one of those you talked about, I'm going to lump them together, not, not being a good researcher here for a second. Um, they found effects on stability of employment. They found effects on the stability of the care. They found effects on satisfaction. They have found less transitions for the child. I mean, it, all the things we care about, from the work support to the t quality, from the change in the eligibility policy in the subsidy system. It was, I mean, it was actually much more results than I was confident. I mean, yeah. I believe those things would happen, but to actually be able to show it in a random experiment right, was right. pretty phenomenal. Let me ask just real quick, is Illinois one of the build states? I can't remember the seven, yes, okay. so. So maybe we can stay with Illinois for a moment here, um, because I'm curious. So, build for those who don't know, seven states that you work with, right, and provide nine, assist nine now. Okay, you provide assistance for on a lot of these issues um, in terms of building quality and QRIS systems. And I'm just wondering if there are intersection points between the kind of 
policy tweaking that you're talking about there that a state like Illinois is doing that then is leading to more st stability for families that that research has shown we way, way down the road can actually lead to better outcomes for, for kids and even maybe school readiness, although I don't know if we have those exact, you know, obviously that's connecting a lot of dots there, right? Um, and then things like um, other approaches that Illinois has taken to, you know, obviously there's universal, uh, well, it's not truly universal yet, but there's preschool for all programs in Illinois and others. Um, and if there are connection points within a QRIS system there that are um, kind of threading these two things together in any way? Or are we still talking about such completely kind of separate um, policy levers that um, they're not necessarily on anybody's one radar screen? Uh, I think what I would say is um, at, at BUILD, we really focus on comprehensive early childhood systems and try to look at, so early learning is one system of several that need to be linked. And so family leadership and support is another, and the whole health domain is uh, yet another. And so we really try to push states to think about integrating their policies across those systems. So for example, within family support, that would be um, you know, not, not only home visiting, but economic supports and, you know, sort of starts to get at linking these policies that, that we're referring to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but in a, also, and this may not be something um, we've kind of prepped for, but I'm curious now whether, and I want to go back to the guidelines, I mean, obviously those are ideas that can come into reauthorization of CCDF and other things that you know, we could build on out of the context of Race to the Top, but I'm curious as to whether or not there's room within a Race to the Top competition for, um, for, for states to be able to outline ways that they're, they're also helping uh, families and in, in, in supporting families as much as they're mm -hmm. focusing on school readiness. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't see that, you know, as comprehensive. Um, I do think that there are states, and probably Illinois is a, is a good one to consider trying to do that with this particular competition. Um, you know, I think that probably that, you know, that drive toward QRIS and really thinking about how that <coughs> supports families, not only in their workforce needs, but in their needs, their parenting needs, and wanting children to get, have access to the, all the school readiness development as possible. Can I just make a few yeah, comments? Yeah, one is, yeah. I think it's important just to, to clarify, yeah. Illinois, this was one county for this experiment. So this was okay. not a statewide okay, policy important. change. I don't know if they've, I doubt, honestly, that they've, mm -hmm. probably some of the audience knows whether they've changed this, seeing some shaking heads. So anyway, so this was not something we can peg on in Illinois. I think there's two things, points I want to make. I think that what I was trying to say is that those kinds of changes stabilize the CCDF funding to families and providers and communities. I actually have coined a cutesy phrase for the first do no harm. I mean, at minimum, we should be cleaning up our own system so that we are not harming quality. I think there's a lot that the CCDF, even when it's not functioning well, is doing that's supportive of all of these things. It is giving families more access. It is giving families different kinds of options they would have. Mm -hmm. It is providing a stable financial source for providers who would otherwise have no money. So even in its less perfect form, it is a very critical stabilizing force for families. We can make it more stable, <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to say. But that's not going to, that's, that's mm -hmm. the first step to me. Yeah. The second piece is, and I do think that there are some ways that that can then be aligned with, for example, if you have a 12-month redetermination, that can mix much better with Head Start's year. You know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's ways that that will help things. But it's not going to address the fact that what the CCDF does is allow, and I think, unless I'm under misunderstanding, um, how QRS is generally identified. All of those things, they are not intervening in the market. I'm not an economist, but the child care market does not function to s provide good quality care to low-income families, period. Mm -hmm. The only time it does is when there's a public intervention, Head Start, intensive philanthropic, you know, philanthropic invest you know, investment in a program in a community, unbelievably entrepreneurial not-for-profits who manage to get every little scrap of money they can from every little source to somehow create a package of quality. That's not what we, you notice Head Start doesn't rely on the market, mm -hmm. <laughs> Pre-K doesn't rely on the market. When we're trying to provide sustainable, good quality systems, we don't rely on the market. This CCDF has to rely on the market mm -hmm. because we have families with 
crazy work schedules. We have families that those systems honestly don't work for ba babies and toddlers and infants and toddlers or families in the crazy TANF world. I mean, so we have to have some way of helping the rest of the world access quality. If we don't invest resources to create that quality, we're not going to have it. And that's what I think is a big issue. CCDF is not designed to do that. And I, you know, so I think what CCDF can do is create the access point, the connection. We can, by better design, by I think a number of states have been doing this, and Kathy, you know far better than I. You can design QRES to be, as you mentioned, you know, to link to the reimbursement rates. But let's say you're a provider that has five voucher kids and 30 non-voucher kids. A higher reimbursement rate for those five is not going to allow you to hire a BA teacher. So we have to figure out a way of bringing resources into the providers that we think are providing the good quality care for the kids we need from some other source or by very creatively leveraging all of these systems. And that's where I think the, the payoff will be. Because otherwise, the CCDF is a conduit. Right. QRS is a conduit. They're not addressing the market challenges that fundamentally are affecting low-income working families. Okay. And if I could just make one other point, yeah. one of the interesting yeah. issues for me about Illinois, and it's just a little perspective on the connections between these systems. We did some work talking to low-income, um, what we're calling low-incidence, not immigrant families, not from the larger Latino community, but like, you know, Pakistani and uh, <coughs> Nigerian, et cetera. The main challenge, these were working families, we were talking about access barriers to the Preschool for All program. In Illinois, they actually allow preschool funds to go to child care programs to provide the service. Um, interestingly, the main access barrier for those families to get the preschool for all program was not being able to get a subsidy. Because mm. they were working, they needed full day care. The only way they could get into that pr child care program was to get a subsidy to pay for the rest of the day. Mm. So their access barrier to PFA, to the preschool program, was subsidies. So these are the same systems for working families. They have to work together. You cannot serve the kids of low-income working families if you don't meet their work needs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, that was a very long answer to your <laughs> short question. So. Well, I think it's raising a lot of really good kind of interaction, yeah. connections. I was going to say, I, I know, Gina, I think you really bring up a good point, and it's really important to note that you know, the CCDF in general and the Early Learning Challenge Opportunity really doesn't address access. It, you know, we're really not hitting on mm -hmm. the scope mm -hmm. of access. It's really important to note that. I think what the strategies are pushing us toward is for the small segment of children and families that are addressed with the CCDF funding, that those dollars, uh, that we hold them more accountable for quality performance. So again, mm -hmm. just a really mm -hmm. important note mm -hmm. that we're really not touching mm -hmm. on the scope of access or the adequacy of funding at all. And um, let me ask just one more question about that, and then I'd love to open it up, and we can take some questions from everyone here. But um, I think that that's a, a really important point, and I keep having to, when I, when I talk with the press or others uh, who are trying to kind of get their hands around what is the early learning challenge, um, there's an assumption that it means that we're going to have more and more, you know, slots for children in high-quality mm -hmm. child care or high-quality pre-K program, and, and I have to say, no, it, it, it really is much more about for those kids who are already in these kinds of programs it's about lifting up and improving what what they might be experiencing or hoping to make some better connections and provide a lot more coherence to the system for for parents who are grappling with uh, having to fill out forms for you know the aftercare here and then dealing with mm -hmm. the head start eligibility stuff here or um, realizing that they're not hitting the the, um, the income mark for one, but yes, the other, and full day versus half, and all of those kinds of complicated things that parents are dealing with. Um, I also wonder, and maybe we can talk about this more within the questions, um, question and answer period, but I, can, I definitely get what you're driving at in terms of the fact that, um, that, that's, that child care really is a, a market in the way that a lot of these other programs aren't. But at the same time, um, if I'm understanding kind of where QRIS came from, the idea was to, um, at least one of the ideas, was to provide enough information to parents that they could find themselves able to choose in an ideal world and say, oh, here's a two-star program down the street from me that has XYZ characteristics. But here's a three-star program that's not that much further away, and I'm starting to realize, you know, I'm understanding what the 
quality means because this QRAS system is spelling it out for me and I'm gonna go for the three-star program instead. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, that market driving force that's operating within. If the market QRS. has supported that three-star program being down the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's the that's challenge. It, we're talking yeah. about the high concentration of low-income families or rural areas. Mm -hmm. You don't have the three-star program. And I think that's one of the places QRS is going. I think people are recognizing that. But I think the challenge is that unless we figure out you know, it is just going to allow you to label, this is overly simplifying, it is allowing you to label what exists in a way that families can know where they are. So if they, if they get it, if they understand the information, and if that program exists in their community, mm -hmm. they, which is huge, that's a huge leap, and it's very exciting, but it's not making that community, that program be down the street. Mm -hmm. Or it can. I mean, I think there's ways, think it's one of the creative the edges towards, for QR. You know, yeah, it's, it's one of the creative it's edges it's where it's going, but I think that's the connection to low-income families, families in the subsidy system has to, if it's going to support them, it has to make sure that something happens to make that program be down the street. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that it's really available to them, honestly. Right. So, um, all right, we'll start. I know that many of you probably have questions or comments, and many of you also have a lot of expertise in this area as well. Um, I have been looking at the guidelines very closely, or looking at the comments until you're cross-eyed the way <laughs> some of us have as well. So, um, let's see. Who would like to ask the first question? I see a hand in the back there. And Claire will. Hi, I'm Helen Blank. I just Hi. have a few comments um, to put this a little more in perspective. And I think Gina tried, and they're going to be a little disconnected. Um, I, I think that that there is that that it is very important for children to get childcare as a work support. Congress never wanted standards there. So it's set up because Congress and actually the states wanted the money spread thinly. I'm sorry, but can you just talk a little bit closer sure. to the microphone? Sure. I think it's important to understand that even with weak standards, which Congress insisted on for child care, that for parents, child care allows them to go to work and be in school or go to school. And parents' work status and their education have a lot to do with children's success. So school readiness mm -hmm. isn't just tied up to a pre-K program. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a very important goal as we look to, Gina talked about two generational. I thought there should have been a little more discussion about the fact, and a concern with two generational is because there is so little dollars in the, in the um, challenge fund. It's basically, if you look at the biggest states, only 25 million a year. Um, Kathy talked about raising rates. Well, two-thirds of the st states often pay higher rates for high-quality programs, but they don't pay the full, the, most of them don't even get to the 75th percentile for those programs. If what we are concerned about is that they take apart the subsidy system in order to serve a few m more children better, and that they could raise parents' co-payments, lower rates for most children, and that would affect providers or tighten eligibility, and I don't think that's a good outcome. I and mean, we, we basically have a way underfunded system. We only serve one in six children who need child care. We only serve 4% of eligible children who need Head Start. So if you build a house, someone has to pay the mortgage. And you want to do no harm here either to families. Um, and compensation is another issue. It's a huge problem. It won't be fixed by the challenge fund. And unfortunately, we haven't found an answer. Um, because un unless you're tied to a pre-K program or you know, you're a public school, it's, it's hard to find a compensation challenge. Um, and I think it's important to recognize, even in terms of school readiness, that all pre-K is not a magic bullet. I just left Florida with a very low pre-K, quality pre-K program with only a few hours a day. And yeah. Gina's yeah. point that working families have to have a full childcare subsidy even for their four-year-olds if they're in most state pre-K programs because most states aren't even six hours a day. So I, I just think that this is a good way, the Challenge Fund, to create a framework and to begin to look at, at how we can tie things together. But it's extremely ambitious, and as it goes forward, I it is important to focus on the families on the waiting list as well. Because if you look at waiting list studies, and I'm saying, and I'm almost done, <laughs> of, of, of families, they experience enormous stress. Um, they aren't comfortable where their children are. They experience economic stress like bankruptcy. And in some waiting list studies, a, a considerable portion go back on welfare. And now, with TANF limits, Minis Mississippi just knocked off 4,000 children, and many of the mothers can't go back on TANF mm -hmm. because 
of the five-year time limit. So there's no safety net out there for poor families. So as we look at this, I don't think we can separate access and quality. And I, I do think that the, the, the challenge fund has some language in the criteria about family engagement and work, but it, it probably is insufficient. Do either of you want to address? There's don't a lot there, and I, don't, I hope that I don't, I'm not going to be able to, yeah. to say it all back. So maybe as you're answering, yeah. you can reflect on what she um, And I think I missed a little bit of what you said, Helen, but I think you, you know, definitely raised some very, very well raised some poignant issues that cannot and will not be addressed with this, um, with this fund. I mean, we have to be honest that, you know, probably five or eight states will get some funding for this over a four-year duration of time. I think what we can expect is that that gives some, you know, elusive infrastructure funding for states to field test some strategies that may help try to get at some of these problems. No, it doesn't address the scope or the adequacy of the funding. It doesn't address, you know, the, the full work-life needs of, of parents and, as well as, I think we have to realize that we, we place extraordinary demands on child care programs and early learning programs to be the solution not only for parents' work-life needs, but also the school readiness needs of children. We have to realize that, you know, that's a huge stress to put on a fragile market. Um, and so I think that, you know, what I see is the early learning challenge sort of uh, giving some states who are willing to put forward some bold leadership and some innovative thought to see how they can use that to build an infrastructure that begins to support these systems for children and families. So five to eight, you think that's small guess. a number of states? Okay, Gina. Um, a lot of thoughts. I completely agree. I think one of the most interesting things, going back to the Illinois study for me, and I tried to say this, I'm not sure I clarified it. One of the fascinating things to me is that that was not a quality voucher. That was not a voucher to get kids to, you know, centers. That was, that was simply extending right. eligibility for the existing thing. That affected family well-being, child well-being. I mean, it affected a lot of the core quality issues that we are concerned about. One of the biggest roles that child care subsidies, as currently defined, can play, I think if we do the first do no harm principles, is stabilize. And we, you mentioned briefly, I mean, we did a paper last summer on, last fall, on instability issues. And one of the interesting things is, you know, I, I ended up with this feeling of child care is one of the dominoes. And there's employment and health and housing and Low-income families, you have no idea which one of those is going to get tipped first, but all the other ones go down. And all the, <laughs> or they, child care, we can stop or at least slow down that domino through the subsidy program as it's currently configured, and that is huge. Instability, we all know, all the research says, instability in children's lives is an enormous yeah. problem. Instability in their housing, in their family composition, in their family's health, in their income, Child care can play a role in helping stable, obviously it doesn't change health, but you know, it can change, stabilize a lot of those pieces. Um, so I think remembering what Helen was saying is that simply access to a subsidy, to a voucher, even with its current flawed state, is in and of itself a key element of affecting short and long-term child well-being and family well-being. We're not going to say that that child's going to end up at the third grade reading blah, 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 but it is we know that kids who are in unstable situations are the ones who have problems. And kids who face those multiple risk factors are going to face multiple problems. So it is, by definition, as it currently is configured, a child support, child supportive system. So I think Helen's absolutely right. If we end up making this false trade-off of saying, well, we're going to serve five kids at you know, $10,000 instead of 10 kids at $5,000, we will be, by definition, affecting the development of those five kids we kick off. Mm -hmm. It will hurt them, and it will hurt their families, and it will hurt the long well-being. So I think it is not, this is not something that we should be taking lightly, and I know it's silly in this context to be saying we have to find more resources, but we have to. Um, it's not an acceptable alternative. And, and the other, other point, is, I suppose, it, maybe this is quite obvious, but um, the race to the top is just is, is one tool. Right. Obviously, exactly. right now, it's the one on all of our minds. Um, but I, I think that the coming reauthorization. Well, I think we need to keep that vision. The People think about recent in general yeah. are big, are just a really big. Yeah, but I think we just need to keep that vision so it's not like we tweak this so we take away that. It's sure. That mm -hmm. needs to be the ultimate goal for all of us. Let's take another question. Um, yes, right here. Hi, 
Hi, uh, Jenny Rappaport, Preschool California. Um, I just actually wanted to build off what you guys just said just now about, um, I think from California's perspective, we are uh, certainly not quite as far along as some other states. Um, and so the Early Learning Challenge Fund, um, the, the guidelines that just came out um, are going to be difficult for our state to meet. We have over 200,000 kids just waiting to get into a program. Less than 13% of our low income kids are in high quality programs. Um, so we certainly have a long way to go. I think th what we're worried about is the administration and Congress sort of checking the box on early learning on childcare with this initiative um, and not really looking at a broader, um, a broader reform of say CCDBG, a broader inclusion in ESEA um, that would help some of these more diverse large population states that can't meet these um, really high, you know, good to see um, quality levels, but really high expectations, there's just absolutely no way that some states are going to meet that in two years. Um, so just want to make sure that it's part of um, the broader movement to keep things, to keep momentum going on the issue, but that, you know, we really make sure that they don't feel like, well, great, we got this done, and now we can move on to something else. I'd imagine echo that as well. Let's take one more right over here. Sorry, Claire, just read. Sonia Michelle from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, actually, this previous question sort of undercuts the one I was going to ask, but it seems, I mean, it's just, it's just shocking that only $500 million is being allocated to this whole program when clearly the need is huge. But isn't there a kind of a perverse incentive built into this competition? I mean, yeah, it's, it's like having lotteries for charter schools. You know, some kids, you know, a very small proportion of kids are going to get in. I mean, it's just hideous to contemplate. But isn't there a way in which states that are sort of more advanced in their policy thinking are going to have an, an are going to have an advantage in this competition? And actually, I would have thought California would be one of them. Um, and you're saying probably not. Um, so, so I mean, but are you seeing that some states, you know, some states are just simply going to be left behind because they're not going to be able to get a decent proposal, f you know, together in time? And aren't those, in fact, the neediest states? That's and then those are obviously some of the salient questions that came up even with the, you know, with the first race to the top, right? I mean, when every time you set up a, a, a competition, um, that's, that's one of the dynamics. But I would love to hear your comments on that as well. Um, you know, that's a really um, difficult tension. And um, the way I view it is that it's, it's a chance. Um, I think that the, you know, some of the, what I call deal breaker criteria, um, around kindergarten readiness assessment and around implementation of QRIS. While I think those are really important things and really important strategies, the deadline makes me really nervous for many, many states. Um, I agree with you that this, you know, there are probably states that are far better positioned in this competition than others. Um, and, you know, maybe since it is a, a certain pot of funds and only a few states will earn it, maybe we view it as a chance for those states that are in the best position to utilize the opportunity to really think about how they can field test some strategies that, that teach us all or inform reauthorization and, and the, the broader discussion. I think that's probably the, the most comfortable way for me to view what the opportunity is. Yes, Danielle. If you can just introduce yourself. Danielle Yuen from the Center for Law and Social Policy. I think that we don't know a lot about the, the race, and I think that the criteria is vague and ambiguous and leaves a lot to the imagination. I think that there is no such thing as a leading state right now. Some of our leading states have had major, major cuts in state mm -hmm. policies, in state funding. Uh, Pennsylvania, which many people think is the leading state, just lost all the funding for its TEACH program, which is the way that we give scholarships to providers to get those higher degrees. So if, if we're really looking to states to be innovative, we don't know what's going to happen in the criteria for states that have undercut their own innovations, essentially. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, we hope that the administration will actually message to those states that those investments are critically important. And if you don't sustain those investments, you're not a leader. Yeah. And you can't be innovative, and you're not in the race to the top. But we're not sure that's going to happen. So I think it's really important that the people look at the criteria and that they understand that the criteria and the way that they're written don't necessarily drive 
dollars to the people that will provide quality to children, that they really are about systems and broad interventions in data, in measuring things, in aligning standards. And while that will have long-term benefits for children and families, they're not about immediate benefits for children and pa families. And I think that distinction is very important. And what you raised there, Daniel, also makes me think that, um, I, mean, I think that's an incredibly important that it's, this is uh, infrastructure building or, and, and certainly rewarding states that have, have had some vision around infrastructure in the first place. Um, but when it comes to evaluating and assessing whether these kind of infrastructure programs are actually helping children down the road, we're, we're not going to see the results of that f for quite a long time be because, particularly say in workforce development, it can take quite a while for um, the, t the teachers and professionals to really up their training and have a better sense of how they should be interacting with children and then for those children over time to be showing whether it's gains in school or in health or in their, their own well-being for us to kind of really track that. So I think that that's um, just, just something to keep, there's some patience that's really required mm -hmm. um, on, on a lot of measures mm -hmm. here. Um, so we've got, we've got a few more minutes, but I would love, to, I don't know if there are other people in the room who have questions um, or if there's anything that we should kind of dive into a, a little bit deeper as we as we have a few moments here, I mean, one of the things that um, I've been wondering, and I would just love to get your, your take on it, Kathy, you being kind of close on the ground in, in, in some states that are looking very much at this competition, is to whether or not um, you think that the guidelines as they have been, the, those draft guidelines that we saw, are going to be pretty much what we'll get at the end of August, if, mm -hmm. if that's when, you know, sometime in the end of summer when um, this notice inviting applications actually comes out, or if you think that there um, is a chance for a, a good deal of, of change mm -hmm. in that. We already have, I guess I should note for those of you who aren't following all the kind of day-to-day -day news on this, um, the administration already asked governors to signal whether they plan to apply for this or not. Um, it wasn't like they had to, you know, um, sign on the dotted line, yes, I will apply. They, they can make decisions in the next couple of weeks as well or next, next month. But from what we have, have seen this week, 36 governors have signaled that they um, will want to go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of those are, um, and California was not on that list, although again, I, I was looking at the list myself and there's some states that I know are fairly strong on some levels and they also weren't on the list. Um, but again, that's me through my lens of what seems strong and us knowing that these criteria are moving targets. Um, so I would just, if we could read the tea leaves for a moment here, do we have any sense of whether those guidelines are pretty much what we're going to get? Um, do you think things are going to change a lot in the next <coughs> month? And states may have to be rearranging that. Well, I think we all wish we had a crystal ball on that one. I guess my guess would be that the the major components, the buckets as I would call them, of the, the type of um, criteria that they're looking at will not change drastically. I think, you know, many organizations represented in this room, you know, provided really important and smart um, comment and advice about some revisions that might be made. I don't think any of us know how much flexibility there is and what we'll actually see. We're hearing that it'll be mid to late August when the RFP is released and that states will need to turn around their applications by mid-October. It's all very ambitious mm -hmm. and I, I guess I'm not surprised that some states may weigh where they are, take a look at the criteria and you know, and just say, not worth our effort at this point to, mm -hmm. to push for it. Um, I think it was, because it was optional, I think that's a pretty strong show of support that 37 governors mm -hmm. uh, did make that response. Um, it, I, I don't think that's the, um, the ultimate answer of how many will respond, but I think that's, that's pretty strong interest. And again, you know, maybe just to say that states are seeing that as an opportunity to have a, you know, an investment fund to test out some strategies that might work. And I, I think the hope would be that they would utilize um, some of the strategies that are certainly promoted through the criteria, but also take into consideration the other 
you know, the balance all of the issues that are so important to families and children. Right, right. Do you want to take a moment as well, Kathy, to talk about the um, build in the first five years fund providing oh, sure. um, yeah. assistance to states that may yes, be thank you. going for it. So build in the first five years fund have entered a partnership to try to support states in their um, application and as well beyond the application phase and the award phase to really see how we can influence um, federal policy and action and two-way communication between the states and the federal government about what insights that we learned and um, factors that are really important to states and to families throughout this uh, challenge. And so what we hope to do is get a sense of the states that are really interested in putting a lot of commitment and leadership into this effort and um, provide technical assistance that helps them uh, plan and envision the best application that they can and really with the basic notion and concept of supporting all interested states in this idea of systems building and really focusing on building a, a comprehensive and strategic system to support young children. Great, yes, it'll be interesting to see um, how that work proceeds yes. over there. Um, well, you guys will be very busy in September. <laughs> I, can, I can see I that think already. I we're busy now. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I'll just wrap up for just a minute or two here with a couple of thoughts, but I think that um, there's just so much more that we need to learn over the next month and two months, and certainly seeing the applications that states put forward, that's going to be quite informative to understand where states really are and what they feel that they're capable of. Um, I think that one of the things that's really important that's come out of this discussion is recognizing that the early learning challenge is not going to be, and not, nor should it be, the end-all, be-all at all, uh, that there's so much work to do in this area that's um, in terms of improving quality, supporting parents, the, you know, very much this kind of two, two um, generation strategy and, and how to ensure that we are keeping in mind um, that the well-being of um, families mm -hmm. is also a school readiness measure, right, um, over time is, is going to be really, I think that that needs to start percolating in the conversation um, while still holding, <coughs> I, I think, quite high, high standards for, for quality mm -hmm. and intentional kind of instructional um, play-based and child-appropriate moments f for kids in, in these environments. Um, but it's going to be, um, I think, really important to remember that this early learning challenge is about infrastructure building and signaling um, that at least the administration seems to put um, a lot of significance and importance on things like um, figuring out what, where, where the kids are, measuring needs, gathering data, um, trying to provide kind of some sort of structure and tiers on, on quality, uh, and that we'll see, you know, how the next several years unfold. Um, appropriations and what kind of funding is going to be available could put a real, uh, <laughs> throw a huge wrench into a lot of this for states and, and, and also for the federal government and its ability to fund CCD and for its ability to fund Head Start, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot to be watching, but uh, I, I want to end on an optimistic note because I feel like there is a, a sense that even within the constraints of an early learning challenge and all the things I've just laid out, um, there are some new visions forward that are pointing to um, really trying to provide better settings for, for young children and, and better um, and, and more high quality kind of child, uh, child care opportunities for their, for their families to be able to enroll their children in. And, uh, and it's, we got to keep remembering that even though it's only 500 million, um, and at one point, you know, two years back, uh, when the administration kind of first came out with these ideas and when uh, George Miller uh, in the House and, and others in the Senate kind of first rolled out there, um, ideas for this. We were talking about a billion per year. Uh, we've come way down from that. Um, dis despite all of that, given 
all of the other things that are going on in terms of limited funding these days um, have some kind of attention on quality and on infrastructure building and to allow states to be the incubators in, of, of innovation mm -hmm. um, is, is worth you know, giving a shout out to. Mm -hmm. so, so with that, we can close, close up for the day. I want to thank you all for coming and um, I hope that you can stay in the conversation with us. We'll have this live, this um, web streamed um, and recorded and available online later. And I'm sure we'll be talking about many of these issues to come. So, thank you. Thank Lisa. you, everybody.